Hi everyone and welcome to our podcast series Women's Liberation, the Marxist Position, brought to you by the Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal. In this episode we will answer the fundamentally important topic on the origins of women's oppression. Many people claim that it's inherent and part of human nature to oppress one another. However, this doesn't explain anything. We as Marxists are only interested in a, in a true scientific explanation of our own human history. Where did oppression arise from and how is it linked to class society and therefore how can we bring this to an end? This series will help to clarify why Marxism provides the only true revolutionary answer to these important questions. To introduce myself, I'm Lubna Badi, member of Socialist Appeal, and today we will republish a talk by Laurie on the origins of women's oppression. He will explain this question thoroughly, and we highly recommend also the book written by Engels, The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, to read with this to fully grasp this topic. Now let's get started with this week's episode of The Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal. We all know that women still today face unique levels of, of oppression under capitalism. And this is despite kind of capitalism and, and liberal so-called bourgeois democracy having claimed to produce progress on this point. You know, looking around us today, we can see that the, the fact of the matter is that this progress is, is very thin. At home, obviously, women are still shouldering the massive majority of domestic labor. At work, we still see massive gender pay gaps. Uh, and COVID-19 has, has turned back the clock even further. Uh, women are bearing the brunt of redundancies. Mothers are 1.5 times more likely to have been made redundant or furloughed than fathers. Uh, and domestic violence has increased massively. Um, Victoria already gave the, the shocking statistic in the first few weeks of lockdown alone, 14 women were murdered in the UK. So I guess the question that we want to answer here is, is why is this the case? After all, labour under capitalism mostly doesn't rely on physical strength, and women even have full legal equality in, in many countries. Uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence is supposedly illegal. There's the right to divorce. There's things like maternity pay. Women have the vote, uh, they have the right to work. Uh, in fact, they have more than just the right, women are expected to work in order to support their families, just like any other worker. And why hasn't this done away with the oppression of women? Well, you often hear the argument that this is basically because women's oppression is biological, it's, it's rooted in, in our nature. Men are biologically, physically stronger than women. Shouldn't this just allow them to get what they want? Uh, and this, exa uh, this, this argument that oppression is somehow natural uh, is popular among some you know, evolutionary biologists, psychologists. It's very popular among uh, conservatives who see this gender oppression and put it forward as some kind of evolutionary advantage that's kind of hardwired into us. But shockingly enough, you know, this argument is also quite popular amongst some feminists. Um, who argue that a sort of male monopoly on force allowed them to dominate and exploit women basically since the beginning of time. And this understanding, which sees the oppression of women as something that has always existed, is a very depressing one. After all, what can be done against human nature? However, it's not correct, luckily. Uh, after all, even if men are you're physically stronger, if you watch any detective movie, you'll, you'll know it takes more than just the means to make a crime. Uh, if, you're, if you're studying a crime, trying to figure out why it was committed, you also have to work out a motive and an opportunity. Uh, and the question then is, have men always had the motive to oppress women? Uh, and have they had the opportunity to do so? Well, I think to understand this, we really have to look back to the past. Uh, and that the origins of women's oppression can't be understood on its own, but as part of massive changes in the whole of human society. So it's very convenient for the ruling class to, to encourage people to believe that the way things are now is the way that they have always been. That inequality is, is an eternal fact of existence, that selfishness is biological and evolutionary, that women's oppression has always existed that we have always been governed by kings and by states. But all of this is a, is a convenient lie. 
you know, as a convenient falsehood. Because in actual fact, human beings haven't always lived in a class society where one small group of exploiters are living off the labor of everyone else. In fact, for the vast majority of the 300,000 years that anatomically modern humans have existed, uh, we lived in, in relatively egalitarian conditions uh, that Engels actually described as, as primitive communism. And in these societies, uh, we can conclude that, that selfishness was not considered moral or normal, that there was no conception of things like private property, there were no kings. Um, and in this time period, uh, what today uh, we would call the Paleolithic or the Lower Stone Age, uh, archaeologists have also found little to no evidence of genuine kind of institutional inequality of any kind, including women's oppression. It's only with the sort of the beginning of the Holocene uh, or the end of the last ice age that we start to see some evidence of things like differences in wealth. But even then, this is very minimal. And wealth doesn't appear to have been passed down from generation to generation. We don't see any class differences. Um, and right up until the Bronze Age, we don't find wealthy burials and we don't find anything resembling money. Now, obviously, I want to come on to the specific topic of women's oppression, but I think it's important to give kind of concrete examples of what this kind of society would look like. So just to talk about one, uh, there's this place in the UK called in, in Britain called Star Car, and it's a Mesolithic site, which is about 11,000 years old. Uh, and at, at this site, hunter-gatherers lived this quite basic kind of subsistence lifestyle. They were fishing on the lake, they were hunting birds and deer. And they lived in temporary dwellings, so no house was bigger than the other. There was no intergenerational wealth. And in fact, the only permanent house we have is this one large roundhouse uh, that was a shared building uh, that was central to the community. So it's clear that in these kind of primitive communist societies, the community was working together to build and share resources. Um, and at root, all of this kind of egalitarianism came from the fact that there wasn't any private property and there couldn't be any uh, beyond the possession of tools and other small personal items. Uh, because these were, for the most part, relatively small, uh, mobile hunter-gatherer societies. So they were successful at what they did, but they lived day to day or year to year. They didn't accumulate any significant surplus. And in these societies, we also have very little evidence of any kind of institutional oppression of women whatsoever. In fact, we have many results that show the exact opposite. Uh, people might have read uh, about the discovery of, of hunting gear, hunting kit recently in the grave of a, a young woman in, in the Andes. Uh, and this grave is about 9,000 years old. And this discovery led to research that shows that women in the early Americas, uh, many of them participated in hunting. And this basically destroys the idea that I was talking about earlier that in every society, men have had this monopoly on force, on violence. They've been the dominant armed hunters and women have been confined to the camp. And actually it's the opposite. There was joint participation in economic activity. And this strongly suggests a degree of you know, real social equality. Uh, women weren't locked out of any kind of uh, activity, any kind of profession in primitive communist society. Like men, they could likely do anything they put their minds to so long as it served the community. Now, obviously, uh, there are qualifiers to this. This doesn't mean that you know, we don't recognize any kind of sex-based differences, which obviously existed in prehistory. Uh, but without the monogamous family and the economic domination of men over women, there wasn't patriarchy. We didn't have these fixed notions of the role of women or the role of men. And in different societies, sex-based differences probably would have had more or less impact depending on the particular conditions uh, that that society and that community was, was working in. For example, in these early societies, it's possible that people might have been chosen to join hunting parties based not on kind of gender, but on a physical characteristic, such as how fast you could run or how far you could run. And this may have meant, you know, that fewer overall female hunters compared to men, but it certainly wouldn't have been an insurmountable obstacle like gender oppression later became. And so women kind of occupying this different position in the division of labor uh, at this stage in, in society didn't result in oppression or, or exploitation. And to go with this, you know, where, when men and women were doing different work, the work was regarded equally highly. Women who couldn't go out on like long hunting parties because they were caring for their children played an important role in either gathering food or playing a role at the central camp. 
Uh, and this domestic work wasn't just cooking and caring for children, not that that's not important, but it was also things like making tools, which are of course vital for the whole community to survive. And again, you know, this isn't just us making this up, we have evidence of this. If you look at a lot of Paleolithic cave art, archaeologists have compared like the size of handprints in the art to skeletons from the same time period. We can tell that these handprints were, were made by women. Uh, and this cave art was obviously of extreme spiritual significance. And these, you know, it would have taken a long time to do and these caves were often very difficult to get to. And these women would have had to take a lot of time out of their day and time out of doing work for the, for the tribe in order to create these. And this is an indication of kind of the high regard that women were held in uh, by, by society. And we can also see this in the actual art itself. Uh, and Paleolithic art, a lot of it does emphasize the physical differences between the sexes. You know, we've all seen these like little prehistoric statuettes uh, of, of women. Um, but there's, there's little art that implies this kind of came with any social distinction. So one major convention in art is to draw people of higher standing bigger. But we don't really see this uh, in any art. Uh, for example, there are these cave paintings in Burzahum, which is in India. And these cave paintings are about 8,000 years old. And they depict men and women, but they're both depicted hunting. And we can't see any indication of any difference in higher status or any class. Um, so again, this outlines all of these conclusions about the, the position of women in, in prehistoric society. And these are conclusions that many archeologists and anthropologists have finally come to today. But Engels actually anticipated them more than a century ago. And in his work in The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, which I would very strongly recommend a read if there's anyone here who hasn't given it a read already, he says, one of the most absurd notions taken over from the Enlightenment is that in the beginning of society, woman was the slave of man. Uh, and he says, among all savages and all barbarians, the lower and middle stages, the position of women is not only free, but honorable. And alongside this, uh, you know, this isn't just the woman as an individual, but alongside this, the monogamous family as we know it also didn't exist. In fact, non-monogamy, uh, group marriage, cooperative parenting was the norm for, for most, if not all, societies in this period of history. Uh, and without marriage, without monogamy, lineage was traced through the mother's line rather than the father's. And this, you know, is obvious because the mother would always know who her children were. And because there wasn't any way of dividing society by wealth, there weren't cities, social groups were often divided by kinship. Uh, and this was most probably uh, determined matrilineally, passed down through the mother's line. And so on the rare occasion that there was any inheritance, that there, that there were any kind of heirlooms uh, to pass down, they would be passed to the tribe or the group that were related through maternal lineage. And we can actually see traces of this in early societies. For example, Engels, uh, he writes about the Germanic tribes. Uh, who were described by Tacitus, who was a, a Roman historian. And the Germanic tribes, uh, just to say, they weren't kind of pristine hunter-gatherers. In fact, they were agriculturalists, but their society was significantly less developed compared to the Romans, uh, economically speaking. And you could still see the, the traces of this kind of matrilineality in these German tribes. So if a man was sworn to an oath or a promise in such a way that a hostage would need to be taken, uh, it was far more effective, the Romans uh, observed, to take a man's nephew hostage, uh, the son of his sister, rather than his actual son. And this is because it would be, you know, a, a personal tragedy for, for the man to lose his own child, and it would be a sneer on his honour. But the loss of the nephew would actually be considered an injury to the entire clan. Uh, and Tacitus also, like, aside from this, even remarked that the Roman soldiers were taken aback by the relative respect for women that the Germans had. And they took this as evidence of their barbarism. Uh, and this is something that we see traces of, actually, even up to the Dark Ages in Europe, with things like Viking women being able to get a divorce, which, of course, certainly was not a right really afforded to women in medieval Europe later down the line. So, you know, what changed then? If, if women haven't been oppressed forever, how did they go from, from that position to the position of women in kind of early class societies, which is very different? Well, nothing in the world is, is static, as, as we know. And these human societies weren't static either, even though they existed for hundreds of thousands of years in very similar forms. 
They were also developing, right? And over the course of these millennia, humans first developed more and more refined stone tools. And these tools could be used to harvest wild plants more effectively, and this uh, allowed us to domesticate crops like wheat. Uh, and <laughs> this is a very short summary, but effectively, all of these millennia of development uh, provided the basis for what we now call the Neolithic Revolution, the development of agriculture. Humans settled down. We began to live in, in stationary village communities. We began to farm the land. Uh, and as societies adopted agriculture, the first time they could produce a consistent and regular surplus product. And this product could be owned, it could be stored and traded. With this regular trade, people could become full-time craftsmen, for example. They could sell like the products that they, they made, things like jewelry and, and pottery. And this could be sold in exchange for this surplus agricultural product. Objects of wealth. Heirlooms, jewelry, they became not just personal belongings, but things that could be passed down from generation to generation. But this obviously raises the question, who has a claim to the surplus produced on that land? And so for the first time, we see the question of private property basically being put to human society. Uh, because whoever owned that property, whoever owned, owned that surplus product would also come to dominate society. Uh, so we'll get back to this in, in a minute, right? Because something else that's, that's really important is also happening with the origins of agriculture, which is that the, the biological differentiation which existed between males and females, which had previously led to certain like tendencies in the division of labor, but no institutional exclusion of either sex from positions of power. Actually under agriculture, that was also developing into a much more extreme division of labor. This is for a couple of reasons. Uh, for the first, hunter-gatherer groupings, right, they tend to be mobile, they can't rely on a consistent food supply, and so the birth rate is relatively low in these groups. And this means the burden of childcare on the mother is smaller. Women have more time to participate in the rest of society. But with agriculture, bigger families mean more hands at work on the land, and, and the birth rate massively increased. And as a result, women are spending more time on childcare. And in addition, uh, many domesticated crops uh, actually require huge amounts of processing time. Things like wheat and barley, right, they have to be ground into flour and then baked into bread. As these become a staple, this work becomes a vital part of the economy. And for the first time, this resulted in the huge majority of what we would today call domestic labor falling on women in a way that it hadn't in the past. And again, like this isn't just... Uh, Theorizing, we have proof of this. We can see the evidence in the skeletons of women uh, from who were living at the dawn of, of these agricultural societies. Uh, there's a settlement called Abu Huraira, which is one of the oldest sedentary farming villages in, in the Near East. Uh, and in female skeletons from that site, they have arthritis in their toes because basically they're, they're spending hours kneeling uh, rocking backwards and forwards, using their body weight to grind grains into flour. And so this new division of labor, you know, it actually like changes their bodies. And when we can see proof of this. Um, and now in primitive communist society, of course, maybe this wouldn't have resulted in a change in the position of women compared to men, because what we would call domestic labor was equally respected to activities such as hunting, as, as I've already discussed. Both, after all, were necessary, right, to the survival of the community, and that was the only thing that really mattered. But with the origins of private property, the work that men were doing uh, became connected to the production of a surplus, things like farming, things like herding cattle. And so even if the men were using the tools and eating the food prepared by women, they were able to claim the right to that surplus and, and basically claim power over women. And so the male owners of property were becoming the new masters of society. Uh, and in equal measure, as families grew, people are beginning to live more and more as, as families work in the land. Men are starting to own their own property rather than it being owned collectively by the, the tribe or the family group. And the connection with their gens, uh, what Engels called the tribe, uh, became thinner. And so men, who already now were the owners of this new kind of property, were also starting to wonder why they should even be passing back this property to their mother's family after their death, rather than passing it on to their own children. And of course, this raises the question of inheritance, which is the logical conclusion of this development of private property. Uh, so we can see, right, with the origins of private property, 
with the origins of male ownership over that property, women also lose the right of lineage. Men want to pass down uh, their property to their children. And so for hundreds of thousands of years, for 97% of the time that anatomically modern humans, homo sapiens, have existed, parentage had been traced through the maternal line. But now it had to be passed through the father so that they could pass down the wealth that they had produced. And unlike matrilineal parentage, of course, this is in no way natural because a woman will obviously always know she is the mother of her own child. But how can a father know that the child of his wife is his own? Only by the imposition of strict moral rules and a strict monogamous family in which women are no longer free to do as they pleased. They're considered the property of their husbands and they have to be strictly regulated and watched. Uh, and so women essentially become commodities themselves. They're reduced from being their own people to just being vessels for inheritance. And again, Engels talks about this, and he was you know, one of the first people basing himself on the work of, of people like L.H. Morgan, uh, who was an anthropologist studying these kind of societies, to really challenge the idea that the monogamous family was natural. And Engels explains in actual fact, monogamy was the first form of the family to be based not on natural, but on economic conditions, on the victory of private property over primitive natural communal property. Uh, the sole exclusive aims of monogamous marriage were to make the man supreme in the family and to propagate as the future heirs to his wealth, children indisputably his own. And he goes on to explain that thus when monogamous marriage first makes its appearance in history, it is not as the reconciliation of man and woman, still less as the highest form of such a reconciliation. Monogamous marriage comes onto the scene as the subjugation of one sex by the other. And it announces a struggle between the sexes unknown throughout the whole previous prehistoric period. So this is a pretty big indictment of, of monogamy, right? Um, but, but there's a reason for it, which is that, you know, it really degraded the, the position of women. Uh, and for women, you know, it was, it was a real tragedy. Um, and well, speaking of tragedy, Engels points to the Greeks as, as a very good example of this. And honestly, ancient Athenian society pretty much typifies how the overthrow of, of mother right and the origins of the monogamous family degraded the position of women. Uh, so the Greeks have previously held women in very high regard. This was shown by their goddesses, you know, in Greek mythology. We can still see the traces of mother right. We can see that, like, for example, the goddess Hera's child, Hephaestus, is born a god, even though his father isn't a god. But when Zeus fathers children with mortals, they only become demigods, uh, demigods. And this is because, like, godhood is being passed down through the female line, right? Uh, but unlike Greek mythology, which in many ways was a sort of holdover from a bygone age, in Athenian law and Athenian society, the situation is completely reversed. And an example, I think, that's, that's really illuminating, actually, comes from sort of early Athenian legal texts. Uh, there's this text uh, called On the Murder of Eratosthenes, uh, which is by an orator called, called Lysias. And it's not clear, obviously, whether this is a speech from a genuine trial, whether it's more of a kind of advert for, for Lysias's services. Uh, but in it, uh, Lysias is defending this, this man called Euphilitos. Euphilitos uh, catches his wife in bed with another man and murders the other man in a fit of rage. Uh, and he justifies his actions by explaining that, that adultery, moikia, is, is the greatest of all wrongs in society. And he explains that this is the case not just on an individual level, but because it's a danger to the whole of society, he says to Eratosthenes, the guy that, was, that he caught sleeping with his wife, your executioner isn't me, it's the law of the city, who violation you thought less important than your pleasures, you committed an offence like this against my wife and against my children. Uh, so you can see that adultery is presented as this very serious crime. In fact, more serious even than rape, because it calls into question the whole security of the man's bloodline, and thus his property and his inheritance. And it calls into question his children, so it's an offence against the whole bloodline. And in this, in, in this work on the murder of Eratosthenes, it's ex explained, the only solution to this, the only mistake that Euphilitos makes, is not keeping a tighter control on his wife since the very beginning. So his fatal mistake isn't committing murder, is trusting his wife enough to allow her liberties and privacy. And here we can see very clearly, right, the position of women in Athenian slave society, 
have been completely, you know, debased and degraded compared to the earlier societies that are still organized based on a sort of tribal structure. And on top of this, right, it's also worth pointing out, monogamy in these societies was basically for women only. It wasn't for men. Men were still free to do whatever they wanted, while women were, were strictly regulated. Every second of their day was watched. They were basically locked in the ha houses. Uh, and we can still see traces of these attitudes today, right, in the way that women who have multiple partners still treated very different socially to, to men who do. And with this degradation of, of women's place in society, from being a free, equal individual to suddenly becoming the property of the man, also came the degradation of women's work. Engels explains that household management lost its public character. It no longer became a public service, it became a private service. And the wife became the head servant. And so all this labor was still vital to the maintenance of society, it was suddenly considered far less important. It didn't produce items that could be sold for a profit. So by kind of understanding this, the rise of patriarchy in this way, we can see matrilineal pre-class societies weren't similar, similar in any way to the patriarchy of class societies. Uh, it wouldn't be accurate to describe these like pre-class societies as matriarchies uh, because they were based on a natural reality, a mother being sure who her children were. But by, and so they didn't require the dominance or the domination of, of women over men. But by contrast, Patriarchy involved by nature, the subjugation of women to men, and it resulted from the dominance of economic factors over natural ones. Uh, and so women become subordinate to men basically for the sole purpose of amassing wealth. And at the same time, their labor, all of the work that they're doing, loses its value in society. Importantly, obviously, we can also see this whole situation didn't just emerge out of nowhere. Men didn't wake up one day and decide that they were going to, you know, use their power to subjugate women suddenly. Instead, uh, they subjugated women for a material reason. And that material reason still exists today. It's property. It's private property. Now, I don't have a huge amount of time. But I do want to quickly talk about the bourgeois family, because we can see the family has changed multiple times throughout history from kind of like the patriarchal household of ancient society to the extended family of feudalism to the bourgeois nuclear family. And this, again, proves that it's not a natural form. that The family develops as is required by like the economic structures of society. Uh, and as capitalism developed, uh, family relations also developed in, into this kind of nuclear family. Uh, a lot of things haven't changed. Uh, Engels explains that in capitalism, marriage, according to the bourgeois conception, is, is a contract. It's a legal transaction. And I would say that's, that's still true today. In many cases, it's a legal transaction for the exact same purpose as marriage always has been, for defending property, for protecting the, the bloodline, for protecting inheritance, and in many cases, for the woman continuing to be the property of the man. Uh, and these attitudes persist even in bourgeois law. You know, in the UK, marital rape wasn't made illegal till the 1980s. Uh, there's still exceptions for mar marital rape in, in, in many countries, uh, which sums up this attitude of basically women being, being property in this marriage. And this attitude that has existed for thousands of years. And under capitalism, you know, arguably, there's this kind of veil of choice arising, but it's still a veil of choice. Uh, in fact, uh, going back to Engels, he compares the marriage contract to the contract that the worker enters into with the capitalist on the labor market. Because in theory, he says, right, in theory, the worker is completely free to refuse the contract with the capitalist and find another employer or find no employer at all. But in actual fact, what would happen if he did that? If he refused to work, he and his family would starve. And no matter what capitalist he went to, he would still be offered the same exploitation. And therefore, even though there's this kind of veil of choice over the whole thing, the worker still comes out of the transaction poorer. And this is unfortunately also true for women who even today, when they're marrying out of choice or marrying out of love, they still undoubtedly come out of the situation doing the vast majority of domestic work, they come out of the situation with worse wages. And even though women legally have the right to divorce, uh, many are remaining trapped economically in, in abusive marriages because they cannot afford to leave. Uh, so we can see that this veil of choice actually conceals what is still in many cases an incredibly exploitative situation. But even with the emergence of the bourgeois family, 
uh, we also have the emergence of the proletariat, of course. And that actually challenges those family relations. Just as, you know, capitalism in itself, it, it contains the seeds of its own destruction. Also, you know, the, the proletariat almost contains the seeds of the destruction of the bourgeois family as well. Because capitalism is, is forcing women, has forced women into work alongside the domestic labor that they already carry out. This undermines the bourgeois family. This was true even when Marx and Engels were writing. Uh, in fact, it was very obvious then. The time when Engels and Marx were writing, women's labor was cheaper than men's. Uh, and so at various points, the men were actually being forced out of work. Well, women were the sole breadwinner. And of course, for the first time, this was giving them power to basically challenge their husbands. And of course, this was something that absolutely scandalized bourgeois commentators who were used to bourgeois women who didn't work and who were completely relegated to the home. And many people kind of felt outraged. They felt that polite society was basically being turned upside down uh, with this kind of turning upside down of the family. However, Engels writes in, in the condition of the working class in England, and, and he points out, uh, he says, we must admit that so total a reversal of the positions of the sexes can have come to pass only because the sexes have been placed in a false position from the beginning. And if the reign of the wife over the husband uh, is inhuman, the pristine rule of the husband over the wife must have been inhuman too. And if the family of our present society is being thus dissolved, this dissolution merely shows that at bottom, the binding tie of this family was not family affection, but private interest lurking under the cloak of a pretended community of possessions. In other fact, he basically exposes uh, that the fact that women are being called into work and thus their position in the family is changing, exposes that this position has always been a false one uh, for as long as it has existed. Now, the, the rise of the working class obviously is playing and has played a very progressive role in the dissolution of the bourgeois family, but it hasn't completed the process. Rather, women under capitalism are being left with basically two jobs, a dual burden of, of domestic work to do on top of being brought into the workforce. We can see this now, today, uh, has been exposed even more uh, even more clearly by COVID, right? Working moms who are already taking on the bulk of the childcare and now taking on education responsibilities too. So we can see the bourgeois family structure has never fit the proletariat and that there are changes in, in the composition of the nuclear family that reflect this. Um, but on its own, uh, the existence of the proletariat is not sufficient to overthrow the bourgeois family, not sufficient to overthrow the nuclear family and not sufficient to overthrow women's oppression. After all, you know, we've had decades of, of hard, fought, hard fought battles by women workers who have generally been fighting alongside men. And after all that, women now have full legal equality, as we discussed earlier. That's equal pay laws, right? That's maternity leave. That's the right to divorce. But what does legal equality actually mean? It means women are shouldering three, four or five more hours of work at home every day on top of an eight, nine or 10 hour working day. It means a couple of women are breaking the glass ceiling. Well, most of them are underpaid even compared to their male colleagues who are also being underpaid. And it means 14 women murdered in two weeks in the UK at the start of lockdown. So we have genuine, uh, so we have legal equality, but we don't have genuine equality. Why is this? Uh, well, you know, Trotsky uh, talks about this in, in his writings on the changing role of women in the family after the Russian Revolution. And he says, a deep going plow is needed to turn up heavy clods of earth. What does this mean? It means the oppression of women is deep seated in society. It's based in prejudice, it's based in material conditions dating back millennia. That nothing short of the total transformation of society can actually change this. Despite centuries of change, the conditions that first gave rise to women's oppression still exist. The existence of private property, the existence of class society. So of course, we can and we should fight for whatever improvements can be made under capitalism. But if we aim low, you know, if we aim that low, if we limit ourselves to that, all we will achieve are temporary or partial measures. And those measures will be scaled back when necessary. Again, as we're seeing with COVID. So what's the way forward then? Well, I, I'd argue, and I hope you'll all agree with me, that it's the struggle for a socialist society uh, to completely change all of this. Um, so, uh, 
just to sum up, uh, let's see if I can sum up everything that's been said. We can see that far from being a natural development, the overturn of mother right and the relegation of women from being a free individual to being a possession, basically, is one of history's greatest upheavals. It's a violation of all of the morality, all of the norms of the old primitive communist society. But we can also see there was a reason for this. Those early primitive societies, they had ceased to serve their purpose. There wasn't any room for development. And only with the origins of agriculture, only with the growth of the earliest class societies, could humanity actually move forward? Could we further develop the productive forces? And with it, the whole potential of human civilization. Uh, and that development, it required the overthrow of all the old forms of millennia past. And this included the tribe, uh, included the old forms of the family and its replacement with, with new ones. And as the saying goes, you know, there's no use crying over spilt milk. It's true the origins of class society was to step forward historically. We're in reality a tragedy for, for hundreds of thousands of people, uh, millions of people, not in the least women. Uh, but that has also brought us to where we are today. And where we are today is that capitalism, and in fact, all of class society, is now just as outdated as Paleolithic and Mesolithic society was back then. And unlike previous classes, unlike previous revolutions, the working class doesn't have any interest in continuing with private property, doesn't have any interest in continuing class society, because unlike the past, unlike previous class societies like feudalism, we now produce everything socially, right? Thousands of workers are working as one to make the economy run. Even if all the wealth uh, produced from that is then being privately appropriated by a few individuals. And so we can see now the very existence of private property is now a contradiction. In fact, it's private property itself, which was, you know, the motor force of development 10,000 years ago, that has now become a fetter to further development. And, you know, if you look around, you know, everywhere you can see that. We can see that capitalism is grinding to a halt. And so it's in the interest of the working class to actually do away with private property. Fight with for a socialist society where property is once more collectively owned. So capitalism today is now just as defunct as stone axes were all those thousands of years ago. And for you know, the second time in the whole of human society, we actually have the chance to build a world where everyone's equal, where no one section of society dominates the other. And that won't be based on the scarcity of resources. That will be based on all the abundance that millennia of development has produced. And in other words, that won't be primitive communism. It will just be socialism and communism. And with that, the family can and will change too. Um, because with the shift under socialism from private property to collective property, uh, we can abolish this kind of possession of women. We can abolish the idea that the woman is property. Uh, and the family also no longer has to be a private unit uh, with the woman, as, as Engels describes her as the chief and now the only servant in the household. Domestic labor can be the collective responsibility of all of society. The position of women can be improved not as a temporary or a partial step forward, but as a real improvement. And women's oppression, you know, has existed for millennia. It's very ancient, it's very deep rooted, uh, and so are all of these prejudices. But despite that, it does have an origin and it hasn't existed forever. And that means that it can be done away with, it can be got rid of. And if people take anything away from this, I, I'd say, take, take that. Uh, we don't limit ourselves. We don't need to limit ourselves to fighting for short-term improvements. We can, also fight to, we can also fight to do away with private property, with class society. And on that basis, we can build a world free from the exploitation of women, but also free from exploitation and oppression of any kind. listening to this episode of women's liberation the marxist position if you would like to read more on this question i highly recommend visiting our education hub socialist.net slash education where we have a range of resources on everything from how to fight oppression to philosophy and more the website of our international the international marxist tendency has also a wealth of material that we highly recommend and if you like the ideas that we have spoken about then you should join us women are involved in social struggles and the question of women's 
women's oppression is on the agenda to a degree that we have not seen in decades. Sexism and the oppression of women is an integral part of capitalism and they can only be removed once we do away with the material conditions that allow this to exist. This is why we fight for socialism and this is why you should join us in our struggle. So stay tuned for next week where we'll discuss the historic examples of women's struggle and the main focus on the Russian Revolution and what the Bolshevik attitude was to the to the women's question. I've been your host Lubna Bari and thanks for listening to the Marxist Voice brought to you by Socialist Appeal.